Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Travis. Yeah. Yep. Nice to see you. We also saw each other recently at the BMO conference. That's right. We did. Yeah. But yeah, great. Great to have you present again. I think you've done a couple sessions with us in the past, but maybe you can give us a bit of an overview of what next gen energy is. And I believe that you're getting pretty close to finishing your permitting. So maybe we can get an update there. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll skip all the uranium. I'm sure everyone on this call is aware of what's going on, but demands way outpacing supply and that's going to persist for a long time. Look, Aero, what we're developing, we own 100% of it. We discovered it. Grassroots exploration led to the discovery back in early 2014. You know, long period of time from 2014 really to where we sit today of, you know, as a lot as you have to do, a lot of uh, drilling, defining, refining, you know, growing a resource, understanding more about it, doing all the studies around metallurgy, geotechnical, hydrogeological, everything, you know, stakeholder engagement all through the period. And then culminating kind of where we are today, which is, you know, entering the project execution phase and actually delivering the project to those future uranium needs and and helping, trying to help anyways, doing our part to try to balance the market, even though one arrow isn't going to get us there. Arrow is, you know, tier one probably gets thrown around in the mining sector a lot. This truly is a tier one, a strategic tier one. It's like a one of one, frankly. Um, You know, it's at the lowest end of the cost curve, long life, we're permitting for 24 years. It's environmentally elite. What do we mean by that? It's a tiny little mine because the grades are very high. It's all contained within competent basement rock. So it's very clean metallurgy, very safe for humans to work in um, underground um, and a very small physical footprint. And so all the benefits of that, meaning low carbon intensity, low you know, water consumption, air quality, noise, everything related to that is all very, very much minimized. Um, and then it's all, uh, you know, in the heart of Saskatchewan, which is consistently ranked the world's best mining jurisdiction in Canada. And and uh, I frankly, I don't know how good the, I, I just saw they got ranked second best in the world. I don't know how uh, the number one could be better than Saskatchewan. Frankly, it's it's a real privilege to work there. So it's a very exciting project. It's going to be the world's largest, lowest cost uranium mine. Um, and we're going through, as I said, this project execution phase. Now, you know, like um, Tim and Jord, um, you know, having projects and developing projects like these being controlled by commercial um, public companies, diversified commercial public companies like, you know, ISO, Sky Harbor and ourselves, you know, this is something that the world really, really needs because right now, you know, over 71% of uranium production is from state owned um, or quasi controlled companies. You know, that's not a bad, you know, having those um, players be in the market is not necessarily a bad thing or anything. It's just the risk profile changes with that when geopolitics comes into play and you're not just dealing with uranium, but you're dealing with, you know, geopolitical events as we're all well aware of. Um, Arrow and our Rook One project, you know, producing, you know, close to 30 million pounds a year is going to have a huge impact on re-diversifying global uranium supply chains um, and something that I think the world um, should and will op- uh, welcome with open arms. In terms of what we're talking about, um, in terms of the specifics of these economics and why it's such a, you know, strategic tier one type asset, well, you know, I, at spot pricing today, you're talking about a four and a half billion dollar after tax NPV, an IRR similar to, you know, an oil well, not really a mine in terms of like 60% IRR and then, you know, it's going to cost us a billion three to put it into production might sound like a big number, but it pays itself back in about nine months. Um, so it's, it's just a really, really a freak of a deposit and a project. Um, and it's really driven from the fact again, that it's contained in the basement rock yet. It's very, very high grade. So mining and processing all very conventional, all very environmentally elite. And then you have grades that really um, create these gigantic margins that you see. Cash flows and EBITDA, you're talking about well in excess of a billion dollars annually. You know, when you look at the top 10 global mining companies, that really elevates us into that top 10 global mining category um, by that metric of, of annualized free cash flow. So, you know, where we sit today relative to where we're going to be in the not too distant future is, is a very big gap. And, and uh, we're very excited to deliver. Um, going into that. This just gives you a sense of how robust 
the project economics are. You know, I should mention actually before I go on that all of these numbers, as good as they are, are represented by an 11 year feasibility study, Mine Life, which is based on. Um, based on NF43-101 compliance on the measured and indicated category of resources. We are permitting the project, and we'll touch on where we sit with that in a moment, but we are permitting the project for 24 years of operating life. So um, lots of life ahead of it, um, for sure. These numbers, again, are all based on that kind of 11-year phase one of the project uh, from the feasibility study. Um, but as you can see, I mean, you know, you start getting into like, so spot prices call it 60. We're dropped a little bit over the last couple of weeks, but call it 60. Um, you know, that's where these numbers sit. When you start going up into into more incentive pricing ranges, you know, the numbers start to get um, quite large quite quickly. And that's again, driven by the, the margins of the project. Um, and it's very, very exciting. Uh, we'll skip that one in the interest of time. This one, I'm sure everyone's seen, we've had this slide for a very long time, but this really is what drives, this, this cartoon really is the driver of the value of Arrow um, because you know the, the projects historically, both ones that have been mined out, ones that are currently being mined and the majority of projects that are in development are associated with the unconformity, which is the contact point between this Athabasca sandstone geological unit and this granite basement rock. Um, that's where it's all been in the past. And, and uh, you know, it's been mined successfully in the past and everything. Um, Arrow is really the first of its kind where it's as large and high grade as the projects you've seen in the Eastern Athabasca Basin and at that unconformity, um, but we don't have um, geotechnical and hydrogeological characteristics um, to deal with in that way. So again, that's a key differentiator, key driver of why those economics are the way they are. It's not to say this is the only way it has to be done at all. Again, these have been successfully mined either out or are currently being mined or, you know, have very, uh, strong plans to mine in the future. All I'm saying is that this is a, this is a huge benefit for us and really what drives those economics, because a lot of people look at those and think, well, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because of this setting. Um, again, that drives conventional, everything's conventional, which is, again, a huge differentiator. Historically, in, in Canadian uranium, you've had grade, you've had volume, but you've had some challenging geotechnical and, and, and underground settings to, to figure out, and they have figured them out in a lot of cases. Um, but, it, but it's not conventional. It's not, it's not as predictable. It's not as low risk, technically. Um, with ours, you know, it will be very much conventional, both in terms of mining and processing. Arrow, you know, what we showed you there is, uh, as I said, just an absolute freak of a project, but we don't even know what Arrow is yet in total. Like we have an extremely good and strong handle on um, what's in the feasibility study, obviously, and that, and that environmental assessment case of 24 years, but we don't know beyond that, the deposits open really everywhere. And on top of that, so when you kind of like look at that and then you start stepping out, it gets even more unknown in terms of the true potential or testing the potential. We know the potential is there, but testing it. As you can see, this is Arrow here. Um, this is one of the corridors. These are these large regional, you know, effectively like cracks in the ground where the fluids flow. And when you're looking for dams and traps that can slow the fluid flow down, and precipitate large concentrations of high-grade uranium. Obviously, um, these stars represent discoveries we've made. Uh, this is Fission's Triple R project as well along that same corridor. But as you can see, I mean, it's, it's stars everywhere. There's high-grade uranium all over this. Again, we don't know the full extent of Arrow, let alone the full extent of this or this or this or this or this. And then when you start stepping out to all these other corridors, which are equally perspective, you know, we know less and less about those. So we're very confident that in the fullness of time, this jurisdiction um, of which we control a very strong portfolio of land, this is one of the portfolios. We have another package of land right up here called SW1. This is called SW2 here. And then we have SW3 down here. Um, combined, it's about 200,000 hectares of land, all equally perspective. Um, we believe that in the fullness of time, once we actually get to drilling more of these, um, you know, in the decades to come, 
that it will go down as one of the most well-endowed mineral belts of any commodity in the world. And so we're, we're exploring um, continuously. We started back with regional exploration last year, got some great results. We're following those up um, this year uh, with a plan to be announced and coming. Um, but again, we're not looking to expand arrow. We're looking for other arrows in other areas. That's really the focus. You know, sustainability, you know, it's been a key pillar of us, um, of our company, our culture for uh, since the beginning, you know, before, frankly, it was called ESG. I think it was called CSR. And, you know, just uh, just being good neighbors really is our approach to it. And um, so we've been doing that for a very long time. I, you know, in, needless to say, key focus of ours, um, something everyone in the company, it's not even a request. It's a requirement that you're passionate about it and sincere and genuine about your approach to it every day. But I suggest everybody go on our website, www.nextgenenergy.ca. There's a series of documentaries we made. A few of them actually won some con film festival awards um, for um, the one on Dene language as an example. So I suggest you go on there, watch them. They're not super long, but I think it's a really excellent window on, you know, the communities um, that we partner with, as well as our approach to um, the communities. Um, just in terms of What's ahead of us? So on the project development side, we're completing what uh, what's called front end engineering design feed. That's bringing uh, you know the feasibility study up in terms of its engineering percentages. Um, so we're doing that. That's that's uh, going to complete by the end of the year. The engineering will complete. The engineering component of that will complete. You know, in mid summer, that will kick off detailed engineering starting there. Um, after. We're also looking to potentially do some site works at, at site, some things related to uh, safety, things like an airstrip, um, some upgrades to some access roads, advancing the camps, and some other things associated with that. We're looking to potentially start that um, this year as well. And then on the permitting side, uh, we're also exploring, as I said, we're going to continue exploring with two or three rigs through really you know, uh, into infinity effectively. We're just going to keep doing that, looking for more arrows. But on the permitting front, we're at a really exciting stage because next week we're going to submit our, our uh, environmental impact statement. Now that statement is the culmination of nine years worth of uh, work and, and data collection and really, yeah, characterizes how this project is, you know, wildly beneficial for, um, everyone and and uh, and not impactful to the environment. So we're very very excited to lodge that um, and get to that next milestone. And then that sets off a series of kind of like uh, statutory timelines and approval processes, um, culminating in a commission hearing. We don't know exactly when that will be. Obviously, it's subject to um, kind of the reviews, public comment period, and that. But um, you know, the feedback, we've got huge support for the project from our local communities, um, from all of our stakeholders, effectively, regulators, everyone. This is a project that, um, you know, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a question mark around, um, is this a go project? It's a great project on a, on a million different fronts. Um, obviously, you know, economically, socially for the, for the communities in the North, hugely beneficial um, when you start going out from that, you know, the impacts to GDP for the province broadly, huge, Canada, huge, um, you know, we'll re-elevate Canada to the top producing country of uranium in the world, which is exciting to be able to contribute to that along with Cameco and Arano and hopefully, um, you know, ISO, Sky Harbors, Visions, Denison's, everyone really developing this robust, uh, sustainable Canadian uranium production to help um, future the world's, uh, fuel the future, the world's future clean energy needs. And then at the macro level, you know, uh, delivering uh, carbon-free baseload power. Very, very exciting. So we've got this year ahead of us, which is really the year where we go from, you know, defining and refining into this project execution. And that's, that's something that uh, we're all very, very motivated um, to start and kick off um, along with all of our stakeholders and partners. In terms of uh, the numbers, we've got about $180 million in the bank cash today. Um, you know, our daily liquidity is, is rising every day with increased interest in 
uranium and nuclear. Got a fantastic uh, shareholder registry of, um, you know, both long-term strategic um, investors in, you know, uh, Li Ka-shing and the Chong Kong Group, as well as Queens Road Capital, Mega Uranium, and then, you know, a list of um, fantastic, very smart institutional um, investors and, and shareholders. So, yeah, it's uh, very, very exciting. Um, this is kind of our analyst coverage. Uh, we've got, I think, 12 analysts covering us. Um, so, yeah, and yeah, uh, the team, we've got the team to do it, uh, both at the executive level as well as the board level. So maybe I'll stop there and uh, open it up for any uh, questions or uh, whatever you want to do, Deb. Thank you very much for the uh, for the time. Yeah, of course. Thanks for the uh, presentation. I was thinking throughout it. It's 10 years since your discovery hole. Is that correct? Was it 20? 2014, 2014. So about a year. Yep. It's incredible how much has happened since then. So congratulations to you and the whole team.